Hello everybody, this is Anthony for Investors Undergrounds. Today, I have an opportunity to speak with one of the outstanding members in the Investors Underground community. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ed Berry. Ed graduated college from Penn State and went on to work at a wealth management firm. He eventually learned how to trade and grew his small account from just a few hundred dollars into well over 10,000. He hit some bumps along the way and had to scale down his trading. He restarted again in 2020 while maintaining a part-time job as a financial safety net, and he has found success. You can follow him on Twitter at EdBerry4. Hello, Ed. Thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. Hey, Anthony. It's good to see you again as well. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. I'm really excited to get started and uh, get into this conversation with you. Absolutely. There's a lot that I want to ask you, Ed. Maybe it's best for me to just start simply. How did you get interested in the stock market and how did you discover trading? Yeah, I remember this moment quite well, actually. Uh, several years ago, I was in high school uh, one night watching TV with my dad and we came across this show called Wall Street Warriors. And in the first, somewhere in the first couple of episodes, Tim Sykes was featured on there. And I saw this young guy sitting at home in his bathrobe, just making millions of dollars on his laptop. And I thought, that's it. That's what I want to do for a living. I want to be like that guy. So uh, I went to school for finance, thinking that would be the, the path to, to, you know, to get into trading. Um, I wouldn't say finance necess uh, finance degree was necessarily the, uh, the end all be all. It was not particularly helpful to becoming a trader, but that's how I got started. So you were interested in stocks based on what you saw on TV. And did you find that your academic uh, career was exactly what trading would be or was it significantly different? Basically, completely different. Uh, finance degree programs will teach you more or less how to construct a well-balanced 60-40 mutual fund portfolio for you know, long-term growth or appreciation, uh, a lot of slow moving uh, decisions, a lot of rebalancing quarter to quarter, um, really not all that similar at all to trading and being in and out of positions intraday. And unfortunately, uh, you learn a bit about reading uh, financial statements and press releases and things of that nature, I guess, balance sheets, but it's, doesn't really prepare you all that much for actually being in the market. And so how did you learn how to trade? What were some of the first resources that you came across? Were there any traders who were influential to you? And do you remember some of your first trades? Yeah, so uh, I did go and find Tim Sykes again uh, once I had a few, a few dollars to throw into a trading account after I got out of school. Um, and I found his Profitly site and I got started on there watching video lessons. I think I bought a couple of his DVDs, um, but I really learned a ton from being in the room, uh, in his chat room. And I learned a lot from him. Guys like Tim Gratani, Michael Good were in there constantly uh, freely sharing all the information I needed to really get a handle on trading OTC stocks specifically. And I got particularly good at trading OTC promotions or pump and dumps as they're called. And uh, that was my first experience with trading, and it was fairly successful over the first couple of years. I started with like seven or eight hundred dollars, a very very small account. Um, and I actually remember going to a grocery store to Western Union some money uh, to this offshore broker called SureTrader because you didn't have to operate under the PTT rule there. Uh, with such a small account, though, the commissions were still a killer. I mean, even if it's only five or six dollars a ticket, that's like one percent of your account, you know, <laughs> when you're trading with less than a thousand dollars. So it was tough getting started, but penny stocks really are a phenomenal way to to grow a small account like that pretty quickly because the percentage gains can be really pretty impressive and. Um, once you understand where the levels are that you need to be buying and selling, the risk is really only getting caught in the dumps. So I'm assuming that you were trading the majority on the long side. Is that accurate? Yeah, 100%. 
uh, I was not able to short anything at that point. I, I think maybe from time to time, Sure Trader actually had shares. Um, so maybe I shouldn't say never. Uh, there, there were probably a few occasions where I was able to get short on some of them. But for the most part, yeah, I, I was going along. Was that difficult for you, you know, mentally to sort of grasp the concept of, of now you are able to grow this account and maybe some, there might've been some interest to just like hammer on, on the size or what were the emotions like there? Yeah. So it was exciting. And at the time I thought that these pump and dumps were just going to go on forever. And I always traded scared. I was always anxious about getting in a position. And once I was in, I was watching every tick and I never really got comfortable. Uh, but I kind of thought I had time. I, I never really pressed as much as I probably should have to go to the account quicker because I didn't realize that by the time I started trading them, awesome penny stocks and some of the other bigger promoters of that time were getting pretty close to their end, unfortunately. Um, and at, at some point, that, that's what did happen. Uh, the SEC stepped in and basically just shut down all the OTC pump and dumps. And I was probably up to about $15,000 in the account at that point. And I was thinking, all right, well, one or two more good good plays and I can maybe get over 25 and, you know, really start opening it up. And that never happened. And then, um, you know, obviously 15000 or so is about as far as I ever made it with that account. And once the OTC pump and dump game got shut down, um, things uh, started to get a lot harder when I decided I needed to stocks because the OTC market was just dead. And um, I, I really struggled with that. Yeah, trying to move on to listed stocks was was hard. And so how did you proceed? You know, did you wait for the account to get to a certain amount before you slow down entirely? Or did you just stop altogether one day? I recognize that OTCs were not going to get, get me further, at least not in the short term. Um, yeah, they're cyclical. Obviously, there have been some hot OTC markets since then. But at the time, I wasn't sure if it would ever come back. I didn't know where to go from there. So I actually ended up joining Investors Underground probably close to 10 years ago now for the first time. And um, I bought Nate's first DVD and I watched it and then I watched it again and I watched it again and I, I studied charts and I really tried to make a go of it. Um, I continued trading with Short Trader uh, in order to try to uh, you know, get around the PDT rule. So that wasn't really holding me back, but the commissions were kind of eating me up because I was so used to being able to pick entries and exits that were so clear on OTCs. And then there's so much choppiness and range on the listed stocks. It just operates so much differently. I was in and out, in and out, in and out too much. And I was just chewing up my account, uh, you know, churning through commissions. And I, I just never really got comfortable. Um, the account just kind of slowly faded. I don't know um, quite how long it took or what that process looked like, but I just remember getting really frustrated on a lot of trading days and the account just got smaller and smaller until at some point I just started getting really reckless with it. And instead of pulling the money out and maybe regrouping and getting back to it another time, I just absolutely destroyed the account and blew it up. And uh, I think I ended up with a few thousand dollars left, maybe two or three grand. I took it out, just paid off some bills and just thought, all right, I guess that's it. I mean, I was able to make money trading OTC pump and dumps, but maybe I don't have what it takes to be a consistently profitable trader with listed stocks. Uh, so I gave up on it for a number of years, actually, after that, which is sad to think about now. Um, but I think I needed that time to, to get away from it. I needed to mature a little bit. Um, and I just wasn't ready, uh, to really handle the, you know, the potential stresses of it and, and keeping my head, you know, when, when I got into positions, I just, uh, just kind of struggled, uh, for, for that time. So yeah, it took probably a good three or four years away from it after that. What time frame was this? Was this, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, around there? Let's see. Yeah, about 2014, 2015, I guess, is around the time um, that I probably stopped trading uh, for that first time. And then my wife and I got married. We bought a house. I started dumping a ton of my time and effort into remodeling the house. And then she got pregnant. We had our first son. 
And then we spent all of our time and energy raising him, being first time parents. And, you know, a few years go by and um, I'm doing all these other things. I'm staying plenty busy. And I have this, this job that I took specifically so that I could work from home and continue to try trading. But now that I kind of quit on trading, this job is no longer so attractive because it's not really finance related. It leaves a huge hole in my resume that doesn't really relate to, to what my degree is in. So I'm thinking, how am I going to build a new career? I start working with a career coach, uh, reaching out to other friends of mine who had uh, had success and trying to figure out where I was going to go next to um, get, you know, get a new career started and basically start from scratch. Uh, and at this point, I'm probably about 31, 32 years old. Um, and most of my previous experience is, is pretty irrelevant. So it's, uh, I'm in a tough spot. And then uh, 2020 comes around, COVID happens, and uh, everything shuts down. And my wife and I are home. Our son is home from daycare. We're not paying daycare. We're not paying for gas. We're not paying for a lot of things, actually. I'm still working. She's still getting a paycheck. And all of a sudden, we have some extra money coming in. And then the stimulus checks come around. And a buddy of mine texted me a link, a referral link to his Robinhood to get me to sign up. He goes, hey, you get a, you know, you get a few shares of stock. I get a few shares of stock. You know, maybe, maybe mess around with trading again. You know, just give it a shot. And I thought, yeah, why not? What do I got to lose? So I put $2,000 into a Robinhood account, knowing that the stimulus check would cover that if I blew it all. And I uh, kind of just started messing around, literally trading from my phone um, in the middle of the COVID lockdowns. And I immediately got hooked on it again. I, I was catching runners from time to time, having a little success here, a little there with a small account, you know, like a couple hundred bucks here, a couple hundred bucks there. And I was starting to get kind of that bug, like that trading bug. I was getting the itch to get back into it. So I opened up an E-Trade account. And then I opened up an interactive brokers account. And then I still had the Robinhood account. I think I ended up with four accounts altogether at one point. And as time went on, I just kept, you know, trying to pinch my pennies and throw a few hundred bucks in or a thousand dollars in. And then at some point I worked my way up to like 10 or $12,000 across four, four different accounts. And so I had more day trades and um, I was starting to have some success again buying and selling penny stocks, uh, a lot of morning panic setups, um, good bounce plays uh, really helped. Uh, the occasional listed stock, I might catch it and actually manage to hold it long enough. And uh, I was getting some confidence again. And I'm around that same level again, where I'm like halfway to PDT. And I'm starting to think I might want to give it a shot again. And uh, then we decided to buy a house. So I take all that money out of all my trading accounts, use every penny of it uh, to put towards the down payment for the new house. Actually, even had to borrow some money from family to pay for the new house, which is technically a gift that we never paid back. Uh, but all in all, we used every dollar we had to finance the new house. But fortunately, selling the old house, we had a ton of equity in it because I spent all that time and money fixing it up. And we ended up selling it for like, 60 or $70,000 more than we owed on it. So I get this big check and I talked to my wife about it and we agreed that I would take 30,000 of it, put it into a trading account, give it one more shot, see if I can make a go of it. And this is around the end of 2020, maybe September, October of 2020. And uh, that's when things were really started to pick up again. And I, I really got on a, a, quite a roll there uh, towards the end of 2020, early 2021. Ed, do you think the time off between when you first started trading to when you started trading again um, was beneficial? It sounds like you matured as a person, definitely had some more life events happen, um, and you were in a position of financial strength. It sounds like you had some money coming in, had more money than, um, than maybe a lot of traders start with. So do you think it was helpful to have some of that time off? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, both of those things were very helpful. Having the time away from it, maturity made a huge difference. Um, and also being in a better financial position, without a doubt, made a big difference. Uh, it's, it's a huge help to be able to trade as kind of a hobby or something you're working on, but you're not depending on. 
Uh, it's very hard when, especially when I was younger, I put so much pressure on myself to make a career out of it. And I was just putting all this undue stress and pressure on my trades. And the second time around, it was kind of like, ah, you know, I never really took it all that seriously until it got serious. You know, I just thought it's worth a shot. If I, you know, if I don't succeed, no big deal. I have a nice job that I'm, you know, I have a comfortable income from. I could do almost anything else and still keep this part-time job because it was work from home. I could do it at any time of day. Um, so it was a super convenient way of easing back into trading, kind of doing it on my own terms, whatever hours were most convenient, whatever hours I was most productive. Um, and it, it, it worked out quite a bit better the second time around for those reasons. And of course, the, just the age and maturity and, uh, just being a little older and, uh, having a different outlook on everything, uh, was, was a huge benefit. That's excellent. And I think it's sort of an optimistic note to hear that someone walked away from trading the first time, took some time off and is having success, you know, years later. I think that's pretty inspiring for someone who might not be trading so well right now and might be considering stopping trading. Um, one of the questions that I had for you was, you know, I, I know you had mentioned um, that you were working part time. So can you talk a little bit about the decision um, to trade while you were working part time? And did working part time have any influence on your trading style? Yeah, so I should get a little bit more into exactly how that job worked. That part time job was basically the ideal job for learning to trade. It was part time uh, work from home at any hour of day. I could work at three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon, it didn't matter. It was at my own pace. So I could basically work when I wanted and trade whenever I was available. And uh, it, it worked out really well. Um, technically, the job was 29 hours a week because anything over 29, they would have to offer me health insurance. But realistically, they kind of let me slide on that. And I worked more like 40 hours every week, um, but I always made time to be available uh, during market hours. So it was a huge boost uh, to my confidence, to just being able to not stress so much about trading. Just do that, you know, in the morning and after hours. And then during the day, I can be fully focused on trading. And I know that my paycheck is coming in every week either way. So um, it, it did, imp it had a big positive impact on my mindset, I would say. It didn't have a huge effect on what hours of the day I traded necessarily. I uh, almost never held a position while I was working. I, you know, as you'll see, and we did get into my trading style later, uh, I don't really hold much for more than a few minutes at a time, most, uh, most of my trades. So um, I wasn't necessarily working around leaving open positions or anything. I wasn't modifying my trading schedule to fit my job. It was more the other way around. So uh, yeah, as it worked out, I had um, a, a pretty good setup for being able to juggle both and, and not really impact either one uh, detrimentally. That's great. That sounds like an ideal work setup. Um, were there any challenges that you found working part time while trading? Not really. I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't say challenges. I mean, I think it was a big part of the reason I was successful the second time around, knowing that I didn't depend on that trading money for anything. It was really just a, a glorified savings account, mm -hmm. and if I could grow it, great. Try not to blow too much of it, um, but we weren't pulling money out of that account to pay bills or anything. It just stayed in there for quite a while. Um, I'm not sure at what number I started wiring out, um, but it was a while. I was several months into being pretty consistently profitable before I started using that money for anything. Were there any additional upsides to having a part-time job while you were trading? It forced me to be very uh, good with my time um, because I had a lot of hours every week I had to put in. So I had to be up early, uh, had to be disciplined. And having that job where I work from home and really no one was keeping tabs on me also taught me a bit to be disciplined uh, because some people don't do well working from home. Uh, sometimes you get lazy or it's easy to just do the minimum to get by because nobody's really paying attention. But with the job that I had, if I didn't work, I didn't get paid. It was all based on my output. So I, I got very used to 
getting my hours in, making sure I was putting out quality work constantly, trying to be rested, trying to be focused all the time. All those things are qualities that absolutely translate to trading. Do you have any advice to people who are working part-time while trading or even people who are working full-time but thinking about scaling that back so that they could spend more time trading? Yeah, it's tough. I can definitely relate to that too. Uh, the first time around when I started trading, I was trading penny stocks. Um, I was working a full-time job at a wealth management company right out of college. And what I ended up doing there was I pretty much automated almost my entire job. Uh, I stayed late. I worked, I don't know how many nights I was the last person to leave the office, just figuring out how to write code in Excel and how to automate things and how to make my job the, you know, the smallest part of my day as possible. And then I just started trading whenever no one was asking for something from me when I wasn't uh, occupied with work, I was trading. So I know it's not necessarily something that everyone can do, but if there is a way that you can free up your time to be fully focused on the market, especially during market hours, probably not all of it, you know, you're not going to get 930 to four. Uh, most people don't have that kind of freedom in their schedule like I had with that job, uh, you know, working from home. But anything that you can do to put yourself in front of the market during market hours and just get screen time, just watch, read the tape, learn to read the tape, learn the chart patterns. It, you have to see it. You, know, you really, there's so, only so much you can learn from looking at charts and watching other people trade. Paper trading is great when you're trying to learn a new strategy or you're trying to build confidence in something. Um, I don't think it really is a way to learn to trade though. You really need to risk your own money. You need to feel those emotions because it's so much different when a position starts going against you and you're losing real money. Um, all those things uh, are really important. Um, yeah, I mean, just do whatever you can to, to buy yourself as much time uh, during market hours as possible. Did you ever have to deal with some of the negative aspects of trading while working part time? You know, were there any days where you worked and then you traded and lost the entire amount of what you had just worked for in, in a trade? And how did you overcome some of that if you did? Yeah, there were definitely days where I, um, I felt like, man, I should have just kept working because at least I was making money doing that. Um, it was good that I kind of had it compartmentalized so that I didn't necessarily look at it as, well, I just, I just wiped out my day's work because that money was still coming. And I wasn't really going to pull the money out of the trading account anyway, whether I made it or lost it. So it, I didn't necessarily see it as losing my work time, but um, it it is stressful at times when you're losing money, uh, you're making bad decisions, you, you know you're just really not on the ball some days. And um, you, you, know, you think, well, I, I should have just been working that whole time. It would have been time, you know, more well spent earning money that is a guaranteed paycheck. Um, and it just kind of compounds your bad days trading because you also didn't work during the day. So now you have to stay up till midnight or one o'clock in the morning doing your other job to pay for all the bad decisions you just made <laughs> during the day. Um, so yeah, occasionally it has its downsides, uh, but for the most part, I'd say it was absolutely uh, a, a big plus. What is the current state of your part-time job? Are you still working the part-time job in trading? No, I left the part-time job in April of this year. I think it was April 1st, April 2nd, somewhere that was my last day of uh, 2022. So it's been about uh, eight eight plus months now i've just been just trading full-time um i you know it was more or less trading full-time and working part-time for a while and it just got to be a lot it was like 70 or 80 hours a week that i was up here in my office and uh in january of this year uh, we had our second child my daughter and my wife was dealing with uh you know a four-year-old and also a newborn baby basically the whole entire day all by herself uh, for a lot of the time. So uh, we decided it was best if I free up some time. I didn't necessarily need the income from the part-time job anymore. It was nice because it, it was kind of a safety net that made me feel comfortable that even if my trading slowed down or I 
you know, was unable to stay consistent, I'd have it. So it was a big jump, uh, it was a big leap of faith, kind of, to uh, to just go ahead and walk away from that. Um, but I haven't looked back. Uh, it's It's been nice, actually really nice to have that time back. Spent a lot more time with my wife and kids, time doing other things, going to the gym, uh, getting out of the house, and just living life rather than being stuck behind a wall of computer screens for 70 or 80 hours a week. Uh, so it's been a, a really nice boost for my mental health, uh, overall well-being, just to be outside of this office more. That's great. One of the other questions that I had for you, Ed, was about your training style itself. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the way that you trade. So how would you describe your trading style today? Yes, yeah, so I had uh, a lot of success with OTC stocks again, which is really how I got um, got going again in 2021. For the first uh, four or five months or so, it was 2021, I was trading exclusively OTCs again. Uh, they were really hot. I was making a lot of money um, and things were good. And then it was like June 1st of last year. I remember it was the first week of summer. Uh, you know, when everyone just kind of starts hitting the beach. And it was like someone just turned the switch off in the OTC market, and it was just dead again, cold. There was hardly anything to trade. And um, so I started looking for other stocks to trade. And somehow I found my way to trading this stock. The ticket was SNDL, uh, Sundial Growers. It's a marijuana growing company. And it was probably a 50 or 60 cent stock, somewhere around there at the time when I started trading it. And I realized it had similar patterns in price action and especially the level two, really tight spreads, kind of similar to OTCs at times. And I was able to pick out the support and resistance levels in the same way. And I just kind of started applying what I had done with OTC stocks to under a dollar listed stocks. And I started getting pretty consistently profitable doing that. And I thought, well, this is great because listed stocks don't go cold. They don't just disappear. Um, that price range under a dollar is definitely more active at times than others. Recently, it's been quite active. There's been a lot of uh, low price runners, um, a lot of volatility in, in that segment of the market recently. Um, but it's where I feel comfortable. And uh, we'll, you know, we'll get into it um, in a little bit here with a, a video that I prepared of one of the trades that I made this past week. Um, talk about what I look for. I like stocks that are within a certain price range, like maybe 20 cents to a dollar. I don't really like the really cheap ones. Um, they need to have a certain amount of volume. I'd say at least 5 million shares a day. Uh, upwards of 10 is better. And they have to have a, a really tight spread um, because that limits my risk. And I can really size in when I know that I can get out at several fractions of a penny below wherever, wherever my entry is. Or same thing on the short side. Um, I, I've definitely gotten a little more active with short selling them recently. Um, those are the main things I look for, though, the volume, uh, the, the tight spreads. And the range is is kind of hit or miss. Some days I'll trade the same stock within a five cent range and just nail the tops and bottoms of it so many times that I have a really good day doing it. Other times it's really nice to get in on one of these big runners and just try to go along for the ride and scalp it for a couple of cents here, a couple of cents there, and just do that several times a day. Um, so the range is is kind of, it, it can be uh, more profitable when they, when they go for bigger ranges, but they'll necessarily need to have that. Okay, great. And we'll take a look at that video. The ticker is RIDE. Uh, it's a great example of the stocks I like to trade as it has close to 10 million shares traded here by 1130. The spread is as tight as it's going to be at a hundredth of a penny. It's on SSR, so all the sell orders at 9367 are just shorts trying to get filled on the offer. So they're either below the current bid or maybe just market sell orders. I'm short from 9416 from about 20 minutes before this, and it's been fading slowly, but it's about to break down. And there it goes. Uh, those bidders gave out there at 9366 and it could drop straight to 93 even and then you get a couple of minutes here to decide um, i cover 5,000 shares pretty quick and then i'm holding 10,000 still to see if it might break down under 93 
Looking left, 93 was the spot that it bounced off of at the, on the last drop at 11 a.m. So I'm thinking it might be a good place to cover, but I'm looking for more information to make more decision. I want to see either a lot of big prints going through on the bid to indicate the bidders are hiding their size, or maybe a couple of the 9301 market makers to drop off and maybe give some hint that it might be ready to bounce. Especially with these SSR stocks, uh, these round numbers are really nice places to dip by for bounces because you can get basically exactly the number at 9301 here and uh, risk right off 93. I think I've decided here that it's going to bounce, so I picked my uh, number there, 9316, and I'm going to start covering the rest of my shares. And then I'm going to start flipping to long, and I end up with 20,000 shares long here from 9301 for a bounce. And you can see a bunch of prints going through on the offer. A lot of them are me accumulating my position, but it's not all me. And there you go. Then the bounce begins here. Once that 9301 seller moves, it'll start to jump pretty quick. So I'm thinking 934 is 935 is probably where I'd like to get out since it just dropped from the 936s. So once it gets there, I start selling right here and I close out this position I think in 935s. And that's about it. I wrap it up here and I'm going to lock in about a $110 gainer. Uh, it's up about 170 on the short, so I just made 300 bucks in just a few minutes, and so I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm just gonna go ahead and take the profit and move on to the next trade. Ed, I was wondering, how do you find these stocks to trade? Well, I started out using a Yahoo Finance screener that I created just for very just for those search criteria um, over. I think like 500,000 shares or a million shares or something. And I'd run it all day. And uh, of course, under a dollar. And then I would just look at every single one and watch them trade for a few minutes and see which ones really fit with that tight range and um, the, you know, the kind of feel of the stocks that I like to trade. Um, it's hard to describe other than the tight range is necessary, but even certain ones are way more jumpy than others even though the bid and ask might be real close at times, they might then just, the bid might just drop out like two or three cents or it might just rip a couple of cents. And it's the slower they move, kind of the better. There's a sweet spot in there um, where you want them to move fast, but uh, also be able to get in and out where you want to. So um, anyway, yeah, that it was a very simple Yahoo screener. And then now recently I started using scans. Uh, scans is great because it updates in real time constantly. I don't have to sit there and like refresh the page. Um, and as the day goes on, I oftentimes find new stocks that I wasn't looking at at the open that are, you know, picking up in volume that come on my radar, 1030, 11 o'clock, sometimes even in the afternoon. So uh, that's been a huge plus too. That's been a, a really nice addition to my trading is having a a real-time scanner that's constantly finding stocks for me to trade. It sounds like you're looking for very tight, almost channels um, with support and resistance. Is that accurate to say? Yes. Uh, so that is my ideal stock. And the, the trade in that video on Ride, that was absolutely the kind of stock I look for. So it might only move a half a penny or a, a penny at a time, but it was so predictable. And then it bounced right off the bottom of that resistance uh, on the bottom of that channel. Oh, sorry, it bounced right off the support at the bottom of that channel and then kind of rebounded right towards the top end of it. And I've had days uh, several times where with stocks just like that, that will just drop to support, run up to resistance, and you can just buy at the bottom, sell at the top, and then you can short at the top and cover at the bottom. And you just keep doing that all day. And, uh, you know, the, the gains aren't, huge uh but you do it a few thousand times a year and it adds up absolutely and so it sounds like this is more of like a scalping strategy is is that accurate because you're not really looking to uh scale in for a big move in either direction is that accurate yeah so it is um sometimes i i don't like to call it scalping just because 
those moves that's that might be the whole move it, it might just bounce around in that channel all day and there's not going to be a bigger move that i'm necessarily scalping uh on these fast movers and these you know these high flyers recently that have gone from 10 or 15 cents all the way up to a dollar those are the ones i'm absolutely scalping i'm just waiting for a good entry point and where i feel like i can just start to see the volume coming in before it pushes to a new high or something like that and i'll hop in and just kind of wing it from there and just sell wherever I feel like it's run enough. And uh, those are really true scalps. Like I don't really have a, a good exit strategy. I don't have a plan getting into it. I just know that I can identify where it's very likely to start moving up again. And I'll just jump in uh, and take what I can get out of those ones because they're way more volatile. Um, there's so many more eyes on them. There's so much more jumpy than some of the ones I really prefer to trade. But also there's a lot of money to be made in them when they go from 20 cents to 70 or 80 cents, you know, that kind of range on the day. You can scalp them profitably a whole bunch of times. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And how much weight do you give to, you know, the time and sales um, and the bids and offers when deciding to get in or out of, of the trade? Do you look at that at all or are you mostly focused on the the price yeah so i'm looking at the level two quotes and the time and sales almost exclusively i will identify uh support and resistance on the chart sometimes i draw lines occasionally i'll use trend lines uh, but nothing more than that really uh, i don't put a ton of indicators or anything i don't clutter up my chart with things it's really just the price and volume and then a lot of my decisions once I've identified a level that I'm interested in, then I'll just sit there and watch level two until I uh, until the spread tightens up at a place where I feel like it's about to turn in one direction or the other, and then I'll, I'll try to jump in. Great. And how much emphasis do you place on the fundamental analysis of the company versus the technical side? I do zero fundamental analysis. I just assume that every stock that I'm trading is garbage. Uh, most of them are because they're trading for under a dollar a share. Most of them are on their way to zero. They are like party city that is on its way to bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, these are stocks, the vast majority of the time, traded well over a dollar previously, and they've just faded and faded and faded until they're down to my price range. So uh, I you know, get into every single trade, assuming that the stock is trash, uh, that it's probably not going to go up. When it does, great. Sell it and, you know, move on to the next one. And how would you say your strategy translates across different brokers and commission structures? Yeah, that's a good question. So the way I trade, especially because I like to scale in and out of my trades so that I don't move the price, um, I, I run up a lot of tickets. And so if you're trading on a uh, broker that does a per ticket commission, it adds up really fast because I've tried that. And then if you're on a per share commission structure, it's it's almost impossible to trade the way that I do. You you really have to play for the bigger picture moves when you're paying those kind of commissions. And that's something I have been trying to do recently. I opened a Cobra account um, maybe three or four months ago now. And I use that solely to get locates that I wouldn't otherwise be able to get with my other brokers. And then I will try to identify the tops and get short and try to hold, ride them down for big picture moves. Um, and it's a, it's a whole different strategy. It's uh, much more applicable to what someone like Nate would do uh, just on a smaller scale with lower price stocks, but you're really trying to pick the levels. You have to understand when those levels break down uh, over unders, when the support becomes resistance, when you, know, when you need to hold, when you should cover into the first wash. It's just so much more to think about and such a different approach. Um, it, it, you just, you can't, you, you can't do uh, in and out, in and out, in and out constantly when you're paying those commissions. So it's um, commission-free brokers it, uh, have been a, you know, a, almost an absolute necessity for my style of trading. One of the questions that I had for you uh, was about Investors Underground. I know you just brought up Nate. And so I wanted to ask, you know, how did you first get introduced to Investors Underground and how do you use those resources uh, today? 
you know, I knew about Investors Underground several years ago, the first time I started trading. So when I came back to it, I was familiar with Nate, uh, familiar with the IU community. I knew what it was about. Um, and I really joined again uh, to try to expand, um, not necessarily to higher price stocks immediately, but I knew that there were some that were better suited to, you know, taking bigger picture views of longer holds, you know, different position sizes. And uh, I knew, you know, Nate would be the guy uh, to go to and try to understand that side of trading. And then I'm trying to apply it to the stocks that I already know. Um, and it's uh, been very helpful. Uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily fully focused on that because I need to continue making my regular trades, but I'm always in the room. I'm always trying to watch and learn and pick up whatever I can from Nate when he's talking through a trade that he, you know, he does constantly walks you through the trade, tells you what he's thinking, points out the levels that he's looking for, gives you the charts with the levels on them, gives you his entries and exits at the end of the day. I mean, there's not much more that he could do to give you his, you know, his style of trading. Um, but it looks so easy when you watch him do it. Uh, so far it's proven to be definitely a little bit more challenging um, because I, I, I'm so used to just getting green on a position and just taking that money. And um, it's incredibly frustrating when a stock starts to go against you after you, you had a nice gain on it. And typically I would have, you know, would have closed out the position, but I'm trying to hold for bigger moves and it's uh, it's been up and down. Um, I'm definitely getting better at those. Uh, and it helps with my regular style of trading too, to understand the bigger picture moves of these stocks and, it helps to identify levels a lot better. So I know, you know, when when and where to get in and out a little bit better rather than just relying on the short term signals that I use. Ed, I'd love to be able to go through a lightning round set of questions if that's OK with you. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. So my first question is, what do you consider to be some of your greatest strengths as a trader? My biggest strength as a trader is my ability to cut my losses really quickly. Um, I don't add to losers. I don't let trades go against me for very long. I don't hold and hope that things will come back. Uh, and this is something I learned from trading OTCs. If um, you're you're holding an OTC and it starts going against you, you better get the hell out as soon as you can, because those things will drop 30 or 40 percent. And once it goes to a certain point and you're caught in a dump on one of those things, you might as well just wait because you're going to get filled at the dead bottom You know, if you try to sell. So uh, that experience taught me to be very careful holding uh, holding losses. So um, I cut everything quick and um, I'm really good at bouncing back when I have a bad day. Um, I will definitely go downstairs, spend some time with my wife and kids and try to forget about it. Uh, if I had a bad day in the market and uh, it takes me some time, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes I might delay going downstairs for five or 10 minutes just to kind of take some deep breaths, forget about it, put it behind me, had a bad day, I'm going to have them. The next morning, I come back to the market with the same mindset every single day. Every day, I'm optimistic. Every day, I think I'm going to make money. Every day is a brand new slate. And I never keep positions overnight for that reason. Um, I like to walk in all cash, uh, ready to go, brand new day, uh, every trading day. And what's one area of your trading that you would like to improve on or expand? Yeah, I mean, I really want to uh, expand on my trades for big picture moves. Um, I think that's where really the, the bigger money is, the, um, the better path to more sustainable success. Um, you know, under a dollar stocks are fine. Um, and it's, it's, a good, it's a good income. I'm happy with where I'm at. But it's limited too. I can't just scale up indefinitely on these stocks that I'm trading because eventually I will absolutely move the market. Um, and I, I realized that at some point I actually had to scale back my size because I was starting to become the reason for a lot of moves on some stocks. And that's not a good place to be in uh, because then you're holding a ton of shares and there's no one there to buy them from you. So um yeah, the, the under a dollar stocks uh, are, are limited. They're very easy, uh, in my opinion, anyway. They're the easiest money in the market, um, but they're limited uh, on, on scale. So 
I'd like to uh, try to get better at at understanding the the full day moves, uh, trading for the bigger picture moves, maybe even multi day moves, and then try to apply that to higher price stocks that are way more liquid, that are basically infinitely scalable. Um, and that's what I'm I'm trying to work on now. Are there any specific technical indicators that you favor and put on your charts in order to help you uh, get in or out of a position? I don't really use a lot of indicators. I do put VWAP on my charts um, because it's something that a lot of other traders look at, look at. So it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, I don't think there's necessarily anything special about VWAP, but uh, just because so many people look at it, you will see stocks bounce off of it or run up to it and fail at VWAP on the other end a lot of times. So it's a good guide to at least, you know, not necessarily trade based off of it, but uh, understand where the stock is at any time throughout the day and where it's been. What are some things that you do away from the desk um, to help you in your trading or things that you prioritize? So a big focus of mine over the last year or so has been really trying to work on my physical and mental health, um, especially physically, getting to the gym, exercising regularly, eating well, sleeping well, uh, staying hydrated, drinking a lot of water. All these things seem small, but they really impact your trading. Um, I, I think trading in a lot of ways is a reflection of your personality and who you are. If you're struggling, a lot of times it's because you're beating yourself. Um, if you're trading poorly, it's maybe because you're tired and hungover and it's Monday morning and you weren't prepared to come to the market that day. Um, those kind of things have a major impact, you know, and especially over the long run, the more days you can come to the market, you know, physically healthy, sound mind and body, ready to go focus on what you're doing, much better odds you're going to have long term success. What advice would you give to those who are considering transitioning from part-time trading to going full-time? Yeah, that's a tough one uh, to really advise anyone else on. Uh, it's, you know, kind of comes down to your own personal situation. But I would say the worst thing you can do is put yourself in a place where you're depending on your trading income unless you're really confident and you're really consistent and you know you're going to make money. Um, otherwise, Keep that part-time job, you know, whatever safety net you have, whatever income source you have that makes it so you don't have to depend on your trading income to pay your bills. Keep it as long as you can or as long as you need until you feel really comfortable uh, because there's really no rush. You know, um, in my situation, I was kind of ready. It was still I was still a little nervous about uh, transitioning to full time trading, um, but I had a, enough consistent you know, months of profitability to feel good about it. So, um, you know, you, you got to have a pretty good track record of success. And the, the longer you can put it off, the better, I think. I, I don't see any reason to force it. And last question, for those who would like to learn more about you and the way that you trade or contact you, how can they do so? Yeah, so I'm always in uh, the Investors Underground rooms. Um, uh, specifically in the lounge, I'm in there. I, you know, I'll I'll chat from time to time in there. Um, I don't necessarily say a whole lot, but I'm always in there. Uh, if you know, if anybody wants to send me a private message, I'll typically respond. Um, you know, throughout the trading day, at least four o'clock hits. Uh, I'm out of here. Um, but I, you know, I'm on Twitter, uh, and, and from nine thirty to four, probably from eight thirty to four, uh, I'm pretty much always in, in the lounge. So I'm always accessible in there and I'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has them. Okay, great. Well, Ed, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Anthony. I really enjoyed it as well. It's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been great. My five-year-old is so excited to see daddy on YouTube. So that'll be a lot of fun. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. Thanks for watching.